I love cubing, I love scientific analysis, and I love well-presented data. And so when this landed in my inbox recently, I was like, a gift from the cubing gods. It's hard to overstate just how game-changing this could be. If you're serious about improving in cubing, and you're tired of just doing like solve after solve, not getting anywhere, do yourself a favor and check out this study, or at very least, watch this whole video, because I'm gonna break it down, I'm gonna extract some of the key things and tell you, tell you what I'm actually gonna implement moving forwards, and what I reckon you should as well. Well. So here it is, a 51 page document, learning from the pros, a large scale analysis of world class solves. What exactly do they mean when they say large scale? Well, they broke down the reconstructions of nearly 5,000 solves. Where did they get those solves? Well, a bunch of them were taken from SpeedCubeDB. These were fast solves with a median time of about 8.2 seconds. If you don't know what SpeedCubeDB is, by the way, you are missing out. It's probably the world's best database of algorithms, but also reconstructions. It feels like as soon as anyone in the entire world does an amazing solve within like half a it's there on their website reconstructed. It also has this practice feature where you can choose like specific algorithm sets and I'm actually using it at the moment uh, to learn CLL cases. So a bunch of those solves came from SpeedCubeDB but the rest came from r slash cubers on Reddit. Now you might be looking at this and wondering well which category do I fall in? For the record I average about 13 seconds on a 3x3 and so I'm going to target this video at people who solve between 10 and 25 seconds. If that's you I promise you'll get something out of this. Let me also quickly acknowledge the geniuses behind this project. Stewie, reconstruction god, uh, uh, Gil, the creator of SpeedQDB, and finally Basilio, who made this incredible document. If you're watching this video, I'm so grateful to you guys for putting this together. It is hands down going to help me and potentially the thousands of people who are watching this video as well. All right, let's get into it. Chapter one, the overall solves. So the first thing they found out is that the faster the solve, if you look over here, the fewer moves were required and also the faster the TPS. Now you might be thinking, how is that providing me with any new information? Obviously the slow solves aren't gonna be as efficient or as fast, but check this out. So if you look at this blue graph over here, we have our expected negative gradient as your TPS increases, turns per second, how, how quickly you turn the cube. Yes, your average time is going to decrease, but it reaches this point where you get diminishing returns. That is above a certain TPS, your times don't seem to improve anymore. And so the whole idea of just spamming moves, turning it as fast as you can, that's helpful, but only to a point. In fact, if you look at this green graph over here, you see that people with high TPS weren't necessarily the ones that were efficient. There were people who weren't turning the cube very quickly at all, you know, six, four or two turns per second, and they were getting really low move counts. In other words, they were able to be very efficient. Now, I really want you to think about this. Have you, like me, been trading turn speed for efficiency? You know, instead of trying to find an efficient cross, just going, ah, oh, should be right, I'll just turn really quickly and it'll be fine. Yes, turning fast is so important, but so is being clever about your moves. Now, this page was so interesting. I'm gonna break it down for you. Have a look here. So out of the nearly 5,000 solves, those who solve the cross using two gen methods, that is figuring out a way to solve the cross using just, you know, two faces of the cube, maybe, you know, R and D moves uh, versus three gen, which might be, you know, R, L and D moves, for example. So the cross two gen solvers took on average 0.87 seconds to solve the cross. Three gen took 0.92 and four gen took 0.95. Now I've always wondered this, am I being really inefficient if I, you know, use B moves and, you know, like lots of different sides? And the answer here seems to be, it doesn't actually affect it that much. But what really seems to affect it is rotating during your cross. Look at this, for people who solve the cross using a two gen method, but with rotations, their time increased by, you know, a good 20%. And that happened for three gen and four gen as well. They crunched all the numbers and you can see at the bottom that on average, by increasing how many sides you turn, you might slow down your cross a little bit, but rotating slows it down significantly more. I am so guilty of rotating when I'm solving the cross and I think, oh, you know, I'm just faster if I do, you know, like one of these moves or something. The data here is telling me otherwise. I really need to think of ways to minimize, in fact, just avoid rotations completely during my solve. But guess what? F2L paints a completely different story. Have a look here. Doing a two gen insert versus a three gen or a four gen insert, it's gonna cost you on average 0.2 of a second of increased time. Once again, just to remind you, two gen insert only uses two sides. So for example, R U prime, R prime. While a three gen insert would involve three different faces moving to solve the F2 or pair. Now what happens if instead of increasing the gen count, you rotate instead? Now obviously the time taken will slow down, but the increase it adds is 0.1 of a second. F2 all is completely different from the cross. According to the data, if you need to rotate, instead of adding that, you know, 
or F move. Yeah, that rotate a two gen insert could be a lot quicker. Now you might be thinking, woohoo, I'll just go on, like on a rotation spree all throughout F2L. And that is not true at all. For example, a bunch of you, myself included, might use like two rotations to solve a single F2L pair. And that's really not required at all. What the data is saying is only if you must, then yes, rotate during F2L. But don't do it during the cross. This is information that we've got from nearly 5,000 solves. All right, I've got some box plots over here. So you'll see that in terms of move count, the F12 stage obviously will take up, you know, the greatest amount. 30 compared, you know, 6, 10, and 15, all the other stages. But look at the variability. So much variation when it comes to F2L. And I think that's why so many of the fast solvers say that it's all about the F2L. I mean, yes, it's worth being fast and efficient, cross OLA and PLL. But if you happen to do that in F2L, often because you're lucky, that's when you're going to get an incredible solve. Also really interesting to see that on average, this turning speed during the cross is a lot slower than all the other stages but that makes a lot more sense. It says at the bottom that, you know, the cross can be planned during inspection, but it's not like muscle memory that's actually carrying it out. This page just confirms that RNU moves are the most common ones that happen during a solve, except for the cross, where obviously you'll have a bunch of D moves, but also, you know, L and Fs. So yeah, my takeaway from that is it's okay to do lots of RNU moves. Chapter two, the cross. So what do we have here? A cross is usually done in six moves. I really need to improve in that. And on average, cross solutions seem to be four gen. Even on the really fast ones, like sub six, even sub four solves, it's actually okay to not just think of, you know, only R and D solutions, but sort of be a bit creative with it. You can still get really, really good times. This page though is so interesting. So the frequency of cross color in solves, white's the most common, followed by yellow. That makes sense. Most people are white cross solvers like myself because I'm basic like that. But look at this. Is there any advantage when it it comes to the cross color you choose. According to this, it looks like there is. Of the nearly 5,000 solves, all the ones that started with a red cross averaged 8.16 seconds, which seems significantly lower than all of the other colors. What's going on there? The authors suggest that maybe there's physiological factors like red is easier to spot or like sort of more like mentally arousing. But I think as they point out, the answer is a bit less interesting. And it's because on the next page, over here, I think you'll find the culprit. And I say culprit in the most respectful way, Felix. Felix on average is a lot faster when he solves on Red Cross compared to all his other colors. And the thing is, out of the nearly 5,000 solves, 13% of them were Felix's. How do I know? It was right here. This of course is a huge strength, but also a significant limitation of the data. We're not really looking equally at all of the world's fastest solves. It is skewed quite heavily towards his, but not just his. If you look at the pie chart, you'll see that there's also a bunch of them by Jay McNeil, by Say, by Timon, by Max Park down there, and also by Leo Borromeo, who I believe is somewhere hidden up there. And you know, as amazing as this data is, every good scientific study has to be honest about its limitations. And this is a significant one. In fact, further to this, one could argue that all of the information being presented here is merely descriptive. It describes what's being done, not necessarily prescriptive, like telling you what you should do. In fact, Felix echoes this himself, as he's quoted on this page as saying that world-class solves, you know, they're half science, but also half art, you know, finger tricks, like the physicality of it plays such a key role as well. So as important as it is to crunch the data and get stuff out of it, you want to take it with a pinch of salt as well. You know, one thing I really appreciate about this study is just, you know, all the countries represented in this pie chart chart here it reminds me about how beautifully international cubing is and just you know it's a combination of all the different perspectives you get growing up in different places of the world access to different types of information and speaking of access to information segue i was recently approached by surfshark to ask if they'd talk about their vpn services and in my mind it's like oh yeah is that the thing that lets you watch netflix as if you're in a different country or something like that and the answer is yes but it's so much more than that as i soon found out let me tell you about it Surfshark is a service that makes sure your location is private and your sensitive data is always secure. It runs on any platform, PC, Mac, even Android, iOS, and smart TVs. I've been using Surfshark for a few weeks now and it was incredibly easy to install. And guess what? All they said about unlocking streaming video content was true. I'm a huge fan of DC's TV shows, but here in Australia, if you search for The Flash, for example, on Netflix, you get nothing. But all I needed to do was literally just hop over to Surfshark, choose any location in the United States to connect to, jump right back to Netflix, and check this out. It feels like magic. Oh, and if you're wondering, there are shows that we get in Australia that you guys in the US don't. Like the Titans, which I rate. And if you use promo code TINGMAN, you'll get an 83% discount and 3 months free. It works guys, I'm in my first free month right now. Click on the link in the video description to find out more.
All right, we enter the world of the X or the double X cross. Not surprisingly, in the fastest solves, X crosses were pretty common. I mean, according to this, if you want to be sub eight, sub seven, sub six, a good like 20 or 25% of your solves need to have an X cross. I don't yet know how to reliably plan an X cross. And so the question is, do I need to learn? I think the authors actually put it really well when they said at the bottom, maybe it's not a required condition, but it could be something worth working towards. I think for you and for myself personally, no, we don't have to learn X crosses to be fast. But why wouldn't we? Okay, I know the answer to that. It's not really fun. It involves patience and not just like brainlessly rushing through solves and actually taking the time to, you know, practice with unlimited inspection until you can predict that first pay or even plan that X cross. I know it's my next step, but I really struggle with the discipline to do so. But this is telling me, why not? Why not get into it? It's really gonna help. Chapter three, the first two layers. I really like the way the authors put it here. F2L pairs take eight moves on average, but to go faster, this needs to go down. You know, you need to be a bit more efficient, but the solve needs to let you do it. In other words, it's possible to be unlucky or plain just lucky when it comes to F2L. According to the data, out of the four F2L pairs, the first one took the least amount of time to insert, which I guess makes sense. The author suggests that this could be because of inspection or, you know, choice of just, it's the easiest pair to spot at the start. This page is really interesting though, and sort of expected to me. Apparently the most common slot for that first pair to be inserted in is the back right. Do I do that? I like to think I do. I mean, I try and make sure that I insert my first pairs into the back, but yeah, according to this data from nearly 5,000 solves, the most common place for the first pair to be inserted is in the back right, 35% way into the back right. And then from then onwards, it was always front right, which I guess makes sense. I probably do that as well. But interestingly, the left slots aren't used as often. <laughs> oh, now this one, we get to something really interesting over here. So how are F2L pairs normally insert? The most frequent inserts, are you prime, are prime, are you are prime? That makes a lot of sense. You can insert the pair when it's joined or when it's split. Join would be when the pair is like this and you insert the whole thing and split would be when it's like that and you insert it that way. What's super fascinating though is seeing how the top solvers insert their pairs. Leo, Jaden, Felix, and Max use their RU prime, R prime as the most common insert. That makes sense, that's this one that I showed from before. But look at Timon, he uses R prime, U prime, R as his most common insert. That's the back insert, that's this guy over here. And not just that, but his next two most common inserts are ones on the left side. And then his fourth most common is that RU prime, R prime that all the others, including myself, have as like number one. <laughs> but I mean, it works, like the dude's super fast. So, okay, those are the most common inserts, but I guess the question is, which one's the best? Well, according to the data, so keyhole, split, ones using F moves, joint, there doesn't seem to be a significant difference. Using wide moves seems to be a little bit less efficient, but the author's conclusion here was that the insert method doesn't really seem to influence the execution time very much. Unless you're being a bit more fancy with your inserts and using, you know, S or M moves. So what's the takeaway there? My thinking is maybe simple and smooth F2L is a lot better than, you know, advanced, tricky F2L. For the F2L stage, maybe simple is best, especially if it's gonna allow me to look ahead and know what my next moves are gonna be. It makes me feel like on one hand, oh, why do I learn all those advanced F2L inserts? But on the other hand, that's pretty encouraging because yeah, I can just keep it simple and you know, maybe get really good efficient solves that way. And finally, chapter four, the last layer. So on average, OLLs took 1.13 seconds to execute, 1.44 seconds for PLLs, which makes sense. PLLs are generally a lot longer. For the really, really fast sub four solves, both OLL and PLL took less than one second each to execute, which is crazy, especially when you consider how many different PLLs and OLLs there are. I love this page actually, so much information condensed into one. So there's a really clear speed ranking when it comes to OLLs with our fastest, of course, being, you know, the soon, being the T-shape OLLs uh, and the P-shape, you know, six, eight move OLLs. And then the slowest being these two dot cases uh, and these three over here. Am I slow doing those? I think so, but I'm not sure if my graph will look exactly the same as this. And I mean, obviously I can say the same for PLs as well. According to this, J, B, U, A, U, B, T, and H, like those are the really, really fast ones. And then V, N, A, G, C, E, and N, B, those are the slow ones, but it may not be exactly the same for me. What I'm getting from this though, is that not all last layer algorithms are the same. The author said it in such a great way here. Some PLLs are born more equal than others. I appreciate the reference to Animal Farm there. But it reminds me of a tip I heard once from J McNeil. Find out which are your slowest PLLs and OLLs and drill them. Like get good at them. Why would you just keep them 
them as like being your slowest ones. Why don't you do something about it? It's something admittedly I haven't consistently done yet. I think I know which ones are my slowest, but I really need to take time to, to target it. Instead of just saying, oh, I wish I was faster at last layer, like to actually specifically do something about it. This one's really interesting though. A lot of people really hate on .ols, but according to this, they don't actually make a massive amount of difference. Like yes, according to median times, you're gonna lose an average like 0.16 seconds if you have a .ol compared to if you don't, but trying to like manipulate the last slot in order to avoid the dot case, apparently is gonna cost you 0.27 seconds. It might make more sense to just be quick at your .ols. Quite a few of the solves contained a skip of either, you know, the OLL or the PLL stage, and a lot of that was influenced. That is by using an alternate algorithm set like winter variation, VLS, ZBLL, and finally AUF, that is adjusting the upper face after the PLL. I think I'm not too bad at this. I actually made a whole video on how you can predict this effectively, but not surprisingly, if you don't have to AUF, your solve is gonna be faster. But one way solvers make that happen is by learning alternate algorithms so that they can solve a PLL, for example, at different angles. I think it was at a competition a few years ago when I found out that Felix could, for example, solve all the U perms and A perms from any angle. At that time, I was thinking, what? Like, how's that even possible? And then recently in a Monkey League, I think Timon finished with a lefty G perm that was like three times faster than probably my fastest G perm. So since then, I found it a bit more. And so currently I can solve uh, my J's and my A's from multiple angles. But yeah, that could be a fairly simple thing to improve in. My daughter's actually really good at this, which sort of annoys me, but she can do a lot of her PLLs like mirrored, like lefty versions of them all and often does them in solves. Crazy girl. Wow, what an incredible study. So here we go. The top five things that I got out of this. Number one, high TPS, turning the cube really fast, is only important up to a point. Being efficient is equally as important. Number two, if you must rotate, do it during F2L, not during your cross. Number three, learn how to solve the X cross. Okay, this one's for me. I just need to stop being so lazy and just do it. Number four, simple and therefore smooth F2L. It's a lot better than advanced, tricky F2L. And number five, find out what your slowest OLLs and PLLs are and drill them, get fast at them. So that's what I got out of this study, but don't just take my word for it. You have a look at it yourself and tell me in the comments below, was there anything I missed? Was there anything I got wrong? What are some of the key things that you got out of this? Stewie, Gil, Basilian, all the people who helped you. Thank you again so much for this labor of love, putting this study together. It's not only informative, but also so beautifully put together. And actually the most exciting thing about this is this. It's only the first episode. Oh, I cannot wait to see what comes up after this. No pressure, guys. I know you're doing this, you know, as volunteers, but it's so appreciated. We really, really thank you for what you've done. If you want more tips from me, then please check out these videos over here and subscribe if any of this helped you. I hope this gave you some concrete steps to take on how to improve. I know it did for me. We just have to do it now. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.